now we are on to the final bite sized legal update session. James Lloyd is going to present a personal insolvency update. There's no live Q&A, but please submit any questions that you have. Likewise for Stuart's Shirt Club, if you've got any, any um, quizzing for him, please please send in your questions. Um, so James Lloyd heads the Harper McLeod's insolvency team. He's a Law Society accredited specialist in insolvency law and has been recognised as a world leader in commercial litigation by who, who's who legal. Take it away, James. Hey. Thank you again, Shona. Um, it, picking, picking up from um, my, my, my talk yesterday, um, what I'm going to do today is talk about another three cases that ar arose last year, um, which again, I think were, were quite significant. The, the last one, which I'll talk about, as I say, I think is, is perhaps the most significant. Um, the, the first of the cases that I want to talk about was a case of um, accountant and bankruptcy um, in the sequestration of um, Mr Brooks. Um, and this is a case that um, considers uh, the factors the court has to take into account um, in assessing um, applications to grant consent to the sale of a, of a family home. Um, and the background to this case was that um, um, Mr. Mr. Brooks had been sequestrated. Um, attempts were made to try and have him agree that um, he would sell the family home. He and his wife refused to do that. Um, and therefore, an action for division and sale was raised. Um, and in the context of that, we also sought um, an application for uh, consent in terms of um, Section 113 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act uh, 2016. Um, and in this case, the, the relevant consent that we wanted was from uh, Mrs Brooks, that um, she was plainly as stubborn as Mr Brooks and wasn't prepared to give it. Um, the case had called for a, a debate at Falkirk Chair of Court and that had been successful in getting decree granted. Now, the reason for that was that the um, defences that had been lodged were very, very sparse. Um, the only defences that were advanced were, simply put, we're really old, I've got a kid um, and we'll live here for ages. That was the extent of it, um, with absolutely no um, colour to that, no flesh to those bones. Um, now I had relied on, there, there are two very good cases that um, we have relied upon, the accountant bankruptcy against Clough um, and McLeod against McLeod's uh, trustees. Uh, sorry, McLeod's trustees against McLeod. Um, and those are two cases um, which say that you know, if, if you are relying on the defence that's given to you in terms of previously um, section 34, sorry, section 40 rather, and now section 113, and, and what you have to do is you have to give reasons and you have to settle that out. Uh, what happened um, in that case was that the, the debtors then appealed to the Sheriff Appeal Court, um, and that was quite useful because it meant that the, we now have a decision from the Sheriff Appeal Court um, about how you do look at um, these cases of um, Clough and McLeod. Um, and basically what the, the, the appeal court said, we were actually quite lucky because the, the decision was issued by, it was written by Sheriff Holligan, who was, um, was, was very good in bankruptcy work. And what he said is that um, um, looking at the, the, the factors that are set out in section 113, um, the court must take into account all the circumstances of the case. Um, now, we know that. Um, but what section um, the Sheriff appeal court said was that um, it was neither possible nor desirable uh, to provide a, a prescriptive um, list of the factors uh, nor to determine what we should give to any factors. These, so really it's, it's always for a sheriff to look at what factors are relevant in a case um, and what we he ought to apply to each of, the, each of those factors. And therefore it wasn't for Parliament to say you must do this and you must do that. So it is all quite a flexible, um, a flexible position. Um, but Basically, um, looking at it, what the sheriff has to do is view all these, these factors um, and deal with them reasonably um, in light of the facts and circumstances of the case. One of the interesting things which I, I thought the, the, the sheriff appeal court made was that um, although a, a trustee may be able to have information um, in a, 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 about a debt or circumstances, it's not for him uh, to put all that before the court. Um, really, it's, effectively, it's not for the trustee to say why a property shouldn't be sold. That's the job of the, de the debtor. And we know that um, historically, um, when I had been looking at the terms of the Act, um, we had always put in as much information as we had about the, um, the debtor's personal circumstances on the basis that we reckoned that, the, that there was an obligation on us to let the, the court know that so that the court could make an informed view. But here is the Sheriff of Appeal Court saying, nah, you don't have to do that. Um, if a debtor wants to avail himself um, of the protection of Section 113, it's up to him um, to put forward all the factors that he thinks are relevant um, and to, um, to set those out. Uh, but, but crucially, um, in this case, 
the, the Sheriff Appeal Court upheld or, or approved the decisions in, in Clough um, and McLeod um, and made it clear that, you know, again, not only must a debtor um, put forward the factors that he wants to be taken into account, um, he must give sufficient information about those factors um, so that the court can assess them properly. So therefore, going back to this case, it wasn't enough just to say, we're really old, we've got our kids and we've lived here for ages, and they have to show what, what, what effect all that has. Um, so, for example, one of the, the factors that was mentioned at the debate but not included was the fact that they were in ill health, um, but that wasn't put into the pleadings. Um, and therefore, if a debtor wanted to rely on that factor, um, what they should do is say, I'm in poor health. Um, the reason why I shouldn't have to move my house, at least not quickly, is because X, Y and Z. Um, so, again, I think that's been quite a useful decision for trustees. As I say, it's no longer for the trustees to say why a property shouldn't be sold. That's for the debtor. And the debtor really must come back um, and give us full details of why a property shouldn't be sold or why he should get the protection. Otherwise, the court's not going to do that. Um, the, the, the second case that we're to talk about in this session is a case of um, accountant bankruptcy against Allen. Um, this was a case that one of my colleagues dealt with. And again, a, a, an interesting point on, on quite a rare factor. It was uh, it was an application where we were challenging a, a gratuitous alienation. Um, the background to it was the debtor um, had separated from um, his wife. Uh, there was a, a divorce going through, um, and in terms of the divorce, um, the ex-wife um, had to transfer title of the what was a family home to him, and return for that he had to make her a, a, a payment. All fairly standard stuff. Now the problem was that um, he couldn't get the, the money to do that, um, but at this time um, he had a new partner. Um, and it was agreed that the, the new partner would come on to the mortgage um, and that way they would be able to borrow the money uh, to buy out the ex-wife. Um, so as part of that process, what happened was that the, the, the debtor uh, transferred um, effectively one half of the house or, or what was the ex-wife's um, half that it was due to him, he transferred that to his new partner. Um, what then happened was he was made bankrupt um, and we then raised an action to challenge um, that alienation um, in favour of the new partner. Now, what he came back and said, um, and again, this is kind of not an unusual set of circumstances, was that, well, you know, I, I did all this as part of this, this arrangement. Um, it was all done in good faith. It wasn't done with a view to um, defrauding any of our creditors. Well, we know that. Um, and in any event, um, this is not a, an alienation which is uh, challengeable because it's a gift um, and he tried to suggest that it was a, a gift, a conventional gift um, and therefore um, it was one which it got protection in terms of the act. Now again this, this is unusual, you don't often get um, defences based on gift um, and there haven't been that many cases about what is actually meant by a gift. Um, but in this particular case the sheriff was um, quite easy or, or quite easily rejected that um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the first point he made was well, well plainly it's not a gift um, because usually a gift is given for nothing. This plainly wasn't given for nothing. It was given as part of this scheme whereby um, she was getting the, the, the property in return for coming on board with him um, to buy out the, the, the wife's interest. Um, but more seriously, um, the reason why he said it wasn't a gift is because when you go and look at the Act, um, the Act talks about um, birthday, Christmas um, or other conventional gifts. Um, and he took the view that this clearly didn't fall within that category that was anticipated by the Act. You know, um, the, the section of the Act is designed to cover things like birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, um, perhaps occasional gifts to wife and children and all the rest of it. Um, it's not that, that, that this was so out of the ordinary um, that it couldn't be viewed as being a conventional gift. Um, and therefore, uh, for that reason, um, it was... Um, uh, he, he, the, the defence was rejected. Now, ultimately, what happened in that case it was that the so, so he granted um, granted the orders that we were looking for. Ultimately, what happened was that the defenders um, appealed to the sheriff appeal court. Um, but before the sheriff appeal court, they completely abandoned this argument, um, accepting that it was correct, um, and then changed their case um, to say that there was um, consideration given. The consideration being because um, the wife has, has come on the. Uh, come into the mortgage with the husband, and, and that's still something that's, that's to be determined. Um, but I think from our purposes, as I say, I think what it means is that when you, if you ever are faced with a case where someone is saying, no, oh, no, no, this was a conventional gift, 
um, I think unless it is something which is a birthday gift, uh, a Christmas gift, or something which is obviously the sort of thing that you might imagine it might be, um, then I think we can say no, 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 that's that that that's that's that, that's not a gift that can be um can be accepted. So as I say, it was quite useful because we wouldn't have many cases um, dealing with them um, with, with, with that section. And um, the, the final case that I want to talk about, and maybe the most important of the the past year or so. Um, was a case dealing with the issue of whether or not a debtor has to pay statutory interest um, if they apply for the recall. Um, this was a case of um, accountant and bankruptcy's application um, in the sequestration of Mr VCY, that's how I think it appears in the, in, in the court reports. Um, and the background to this one was that um, Mr VCI it was sequestrated um, in 2016 um, by HMRC and the date of sequestration was December 2015. Um, what happened was that the, the debtor had applied twice before um, for the recall, but for various reasons that hadn't been granted. Um, and this was him applying on a third occasion. And he was applying on the basis that um, he was able to pay um, the debts, he was able to pay the cost of the sequestration, uh, but he was not offering to pay the interest, um, the statute of interest that accrued on the debts. It, it was a case that the accountant in bankruptcy had. Now, as, as you know, um, if you want to seek your uh, discharge based on um, payment of the debts, that's an application that goes to the um, accountant in bankruptcy. Um, and the accountant in bankruptcy had a number of these cases um, which weren't able to progress because HMRC weren't happy about it. HMRC never been very happy about many things. Um, and so ultimately what it was decided to do was to refer, we picked one case um, and that was referred to the sheriff um, in terms, this was actually a case under um, section 17 and 18 of the Act rather than um, the, the, the new provisions. Um, so what happened was the case called um, for a debate before Sheriff Holligan um, and HMRC argued that um, wh when you look at um, uh, the provisions in relation, in relation to section 17 when it talks about payment of debts in full, uh, their argument was that that had to include or the word debts included statutory interest. Um, and what they looked at, um, or what they asked the court to look at, um, was the provisions of um, Section 51. And you know that Section 51 it deals with the order um, or priority of debts, um, and that certainly does mention um, statutory interest being paid. Um, Sheriff Holligan, however, wasn't really convinced by all of that, um, because one of the other points is that, of course, Section, sorry, Paragraph one of Schedule 1 sets out what a creditor can actually claim in a sequestration. Um, and if you go and look at that, that's in um, different terms to Section 51. Um, and it seems to make it clear that interest on debt is not a debt. Um, so his view was that um, that distinguished the two, like Section um, like Paragraph 1, Schedule 1, insofar as it was relevant. Um, can be distinguished from the provisions of Section 51. Section 51 was only an order of priority. It wasn't there for defining um, what, the, what, what was what constituted a debt. Um, the other point was that, um, bear in mind that the effect of um, a recall is to put parties back into the position that they would have been in but for the sequestration. Um, and therefore, if a debt was required to pay statutory interest, um, his view was that that was something which is all consi also con inconsistent with that, because but for the sequestration, the debtor wouldn't have to pay statutory interest. So therefore, that was a, something which pointed to um, the interpretation which the accountant bankruptcy had taken as being the correct one. And, and finally, um, he considers it significant um, that Parliament had not specifically said um, that statutory interest had to be paid in order to get your recall on payment of debts. Um, he noted that um, Parliament has specifically said that there's an obligation to pay the trustees, um, the, the trustees costs and as he, say, he accepted what the accountant bankruptcy said that well it could just as easily um, have um, said that you've got to pay tax interest and it didn't. Uh, so therefore um, he um, took the view that um, the accountant bankruptcy's interpretation was correct. There was no obligation to pay tax interest. When you looked at the facts before him you saw that debtor had paid um, sufficient funds to pay the debts um, and therefore he was prepared to grant recall. As I said, um, HMRC were even less happy about that than the original decision, um, and so they appealed to the, the Sheriff Appeal Court. Um, but the Sheriff Appeal Court upheld um, Sheriff Holligan. Um, they accepted that his reasoning was, it, was, was entirely correct, which is that you know, Section 51, on which HMRC had put a lot of reliance, 
that's simply a order of priority. That's not actually defining what, what dates are. And again, if you look at the provisions of paragraph one, schedule one, um, they are they, 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 they are different too. The accountant in bankruptcy, sorry, the, the sheriff appeal court was also persuaded um, by the fact that the whole purpose um, of a recall is to put parties so far as practical into the position that they would have been. Um, and that too was something that tended to suggest that the EIB's um, interpretation was correct. Um, and also that he picked, that, that they picked up on what Sheriff Holligan had said, that if that's what Parliament intended, it could just as easily have said that. So therefore, the appeal was rejected. Um, and the situation remains that if a debtor wants to apply for recall based on payment of their debts, having paid their debts in full, they don't have to pay statutory interest um, in order to fall within the categories um, or to be eligible to get recall on that basis. That all having been said, there are two points which you have to bear in mind in which um, Sheriff Holligan picked up on in his judgment. One is that um, a recall is at the end of the day a discretionary remedy and therefore neither the courts nor the accountant of bankruptcy are bound to grant recall um, even if the circumstances um, apply. Um, so therefore Sheriff Holligan didn't actually say what the answer would be um, but he did imagine a circumstance where a debtor perhaps allowed a sequestration to go on for a number of years, um, only then applying for um, his, his, his discharge, or his recall rather, by which point there might be quite a lot of statutory interest. So therefore, I think the implication is that the longer the matter goes on, the account of bankruptcy or a sheriff may very well say, well, yes, I accept your opinion of debts, but I don't think it's fair that um, recall should be granted. I have to confess I'm not quite sure if that would actually happen, but certainly it's important to make the point that you know just because of this decision does not mean that, that in each and every case a debtor can pitch up, pay their debts and go off without paying statutory interest and get the recall. Um, but that's certainly what we tend to suggest. The final point, um, and potentially I suppose a sting in the tail, um, is that on the basis that recall puts parties back in the position that they would have been in um, but for the sequestration, what that also does is revive any other obligations that a debtor might be under um, to pay interest. So therefore, if there's a contractual obligation to pay interest, um, that would revive. And therefore, a creditor who hadn't got their, um, their, their, their interest, their statutory interest, it could raise a separate action or if I've got a decree, um, enforce that. Um, and therefore, that's something that I suppose a, a debtor, um, especially if they've been um, sequestrated for some time and, stat and, and, and interest may have accrued, um, should think about before um, they, they, they apply for a sequestration, sorry, for a, for a recall. So, as I say, I, I hope that's that's all been, been useful. Um, if there are any other questions that you have, then I think you can apply and send them to ICAS or to me, and I'm always happy to uh, to answer them. Uh, but with that, I'll uh, pass back over to Jonah.